when the Tony Orlando at Dawn project came along, um, I was a big fan of Tony Orlando. I love Tyler Yellow Ribbon. I mean, a lot, uh, a lot of his music I liked. I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, one of the things about loving music is loving all kinds of music. Yes. And I love, all, I love opera. I love classical. I love hip hop. I love rock, you know, and I love your oldie show. I mean, it's great for me. It's like going back in time. You know, I love that era and that's what I grew up with. But, you know, this project came along and Tony Orlando's management reached out to us and said, hey, you know, Tony's got a new album coming out. It's called To Be With You. And he really loves your work. And he would love to have an illustration. He's never had an illustration for an album cover. And, you know, I found out later that he was a, he was like a staff singer for the record company. He would, uh, when people submitted songs, they would have him sing them. Yes. See, yeah. And, and it was like uh, being a, it would be like a pinch hitter or a, a you know, a, not a starter. You know, you warm, you use that person to warm up and then the real person comes in and, you know, he, he has a lot of talent and he's, I got to tell you, he's a really nice guy. That's really- what I hear too. Oh. You know, people have uh, told me, you know, that have seen him on the block party and it, yeah. it comes through in his Facebook page too. Oh yeah. Well, and you know, and as we get along with this story, I'll tell you, we reunited through Ivor, Ivor had interviewed him or requested to interview him for the book for this particular album. So he talked with Tony and Tony said, yeah, you know, I haven't seen the guys from Pacific Guy in years or anything, but I'd love to talk with Ernie. He remembered me. And so Ivor set up a call that we all had. But backing up here for a minute, when they reached out to us in 1976 to do this cover, I went over, he was, Tony was at CBS. They were doing their TV show, the Tony Orlando and Don show. And um, so I had met him over at CBS and I never got a, a chance to meet the girls, but I met him and, you know, he told me about the album and what the, the level of class that he wanted to see in this album. He wanted it to be high end. He wanted it to be, really something that he would be, he was proud of the music. He wanted the album cover to have that same kind of, you know, class feel to it. So, um, and he had, he had, he had known of Drew Struzan, you know, by this time Drew had done a lot of work and uh, for the album covers and he was really well known. Pacific Iron Ear was well known, but you know, it was also, it was his own entity, but the fact that Drew was part of that made it even better for Pacific Ironier and for Drew. I mean, had he not had the chance to do some of the album covers that he did, he would have never got into the music, uh, into the movie business. You know, because like I said, movies were now trans in, transcending into illustrations instead of photography. So, um, and so that was, that became a good thing for, for all of us. You know, because like I said, I, I didn't need the illustrators that I had as much. And, you know, I could always freelance with them. I mean, Bill Garland would always, in fact, I worked for years with Bill Garland uh, after he left Pacific Ioneer. We worked together probably another 10 years uh, or more, you know, in, in the corporate world. Because he would, I would give him ideas and he'd sketch up and I'd make the presentations to the corporate clients. So it worked out perfect. And uh, I got a couple other designers that work with me. So, you know, the illustration thing ended as the uh, design thing took off. But this particular album is really kind of unusual because the whole time that I had worked with Drew, and even when he was, before he worked with us, he did the Tapestry album for Carol King before wow. he joined us. Yeah, he did the illustration of her on with the piano. Um, and... Um, so when he joined us for the three or f- about four years that we worked together, I never saw him do anything twice. I never saw him make a mistake, you know, where he would have to go back and, and um, well, that's not true because on the greatest hits album, we had to make some changes, but that's another story. I mean, specifically starting over, not just changing something. And he never really did that. I mean, he, he would do something once and that was it. It was the most amazing thing. You know, I mean, uh, I watched him do this 23 slideshow uh, for a Flying Tiger Air Freight done in a Jack Davis from Mad Magazine cartoon style, which is an incredibly hard style to, 
copy and he did it like there was nothing to it. And he did 23 illustrations and he didn't make one mistake. He didn't. And, and the, that style didn't call for pencil drawing first and then drawing in ink or paint over the top of the pencil. This was, you put a brush in the India ink and you start drawing. And he did 23 drawings of this cartoon football team. And uh, at some point we'll talk about that at another show, but it's, it's an amazing thing that he never did again. But this cover, when I met with Tony, you know, he explained, explained to me what he wanted. And I went back and I gave the assignment to Drew because Drew's style was perfect for what Tony was talking about. And, and so we ta I talked with Tony about that as well. You know, I mean, he was familiar with Drew's work, like I said, that he had done. And so we did a sketch and the sketch was a lot like the painting you see right here. Okay. And that is pretty. I love that. Isn't it's it pretty? elegant, and, very elegant. Yeah. Well, it's a J.C. Leindecker. J.C. Leindecker was an illustrator in the early 20s. And he did, he was before Norman Rockwell on Saturday Evening Post. J.C. Leindecker did all the covers. And J.C. Leindecker's style was very distinct. It was very unique. It was, it was kind of choppy lines. You know, things weren't really rendered realistically, but they were so real in the way he did it. It, 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 was, like, it was like a stylized reality. You know, Beautiful. and if you look, you'll, like I said, I'll be sending you these images. And when you see them big, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. And in fact, Norman Rockwell was a huge fan of J.C. Leindecker. He used to hang out front of the Saturday Evening Post offices when J.C. Leindecker was pull up in his limousine and be going out to present the cover for that, that issue. Uh, Norman Rockwell was a huge fan of his and would, you know, meet him and, and get his autograph and stuff. It was very strange. And then, you know, J.C. Leindecker uh, stopped doing the covers and Norman Rockwell did. And then Norman Rockwell became very famous, you know, for those Saturday Evening Post covers. And so Drew uh, really, when we started working together in 1972, he was an illustrator. He was a painter. He wasn't really an illustrator. And there's a difference. You know, painters are painters and they won't compromise their art for money illustrators will compromise whatever they have to compromise for money okay and for the to please the client fine artists would say you know go somewhere else i'm not interested and so drew was really a painter he was a fine artist he came out of art center with major honors and he was an incredible painter but he couldn't get a job as a painter and he, could, he couldn't get a job as an illustrator. He had seen a lot of other art directors and stuff before me, but he never got the job. And when he showed up on that Saturday, uh, I had made an appointment. I stopped seeing portfolios, but before I had stopped seeing portfolios, I had made a, an appointment with him for a couple of weeks in advance. And then I just decided I can't see portfolios anymore. It's taking up too much time. I need to work. You know, I need to concentrate on the work that we have. So I stopped looking at books and I was working on a Jefferson airplane project. It was a, a, an album called Fat. And I was there on a Saturday and he shows up and I had forgotten all about having a call with him, a meeting with him. But I decided, well, the guy's here. I'm going to take a look at his book. And it was amazing. It was life changing for me. I, 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 I say the same thing all the time about looking at his book. It was like looking at Michelangelo or Leonardo da Vinci. I mean, the guy was just he was more than a cut above. He was unique in a category all his own. And I, I asked him, I, why, why, you know, have you had so much trouble finding a job? Well, he was very religious and he had certain things that he would demand. Like he only worked from nine to five. He only worked Friday, Monday to Friday, no weekends, no overtime, no nothing. That was how he lived. And he had gotten married. He had just had a baby and he needed a job. And, I looked at his work and I was blown away. And he actually said to me, you know, if you hire me, I'll work for you for five days and you only have to pay me for four. I just need a job. And I, I said, you know what? <laughs> you work for me for five days, you get paid for five days. Oh, that's you know, great. As long as the work is represented, the work that's represented in this portfolio is true. Um, you've got a job. And I hired him. At, and I hired Bill Garland the same way and Carl Ramsey the same way. It was kind of funny, Joyce. These people, 
came Joe Garnett. Joe Garnett once said Pacific Ironer was like Mecca. It attracted all these creative people. And it did. And I think it was because of the album covers, because when you did album covers, you could do whatever you wanted. Pretty much. It was crazy stuff, especially with illustrators and, 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 and even photography. You, it was just, you know, the sky's the limit. The groups wanted the cover to jump out of this, you know, out of the rack. And so we really found that disruptiveness in what we could do there. And it was attracting other creative people to us. And, um, so when we got this project from Tony Orlando, I went back to the office. I gave Drew the project. We had a meeting. We always had a meeting. Every time we got a project, we put the art department together and we had a meeting about who was going to get it, what was going to be done. And, and for me, I had to have the idea when I presented the project. I had to have the concept, at least yeah. stake in the ground where everybody could add to it. It wasn't always just me saying, okay, this is what it's going to be. And that was it. It was like, this is what I'm seeing. Now let's make it better. You know, because I was very blessed, Joyce, to be able to surround myself with people that were so much better than I was. When you get into that kind of a situation, you're forced to be better than you ever thought you could be. I never dreamed in my wildest dream that I could have accomplished what I accomplished in my career. And it started with Pacific Ioneer. You know, I had yeah. done a couple things like the Stone's Tongue and Jesus Christ Superstar and a few other things before that. But it was not this became bigger than that. And that's where I came up with that. You know, I want to continue making history instead of becoming it. I never wanted to become history and I wanted to keep on creating it. So I surrounded myself with people that could add to what I was doing. Some people you say, OK, this is what I want to do and they'll go do it and it'll come back just like you said. But I needed to make it more than just what I thought and finding the right people, connecting physically and mentally, spiritually with those people uh, made it so much better. And in a way, like I said, it made me it forced me to become better than I ever thought I could be. So sometimes I would walk into the meeting and go, OK, here's what I'm thinking. And they'd go, no, nah, that ain't it. You know, that, you know, we already did something like that. We can't. And that was the other thing. We never I could show you thousands of pieces of work that we did and I've done. Not one of them looks the same. They're all different. And I wanted it to be that way. I wanted it to be because it's very easy to slip into a style, very yes. easy to slip into a, a format or a template. And you can become, you know, you can become well known for that. But then what? You know, where do you go from there? You're so used to doing this. You're so used to running in that template that it's very hard for you to break out of it. And I've known a lot of creative people that, you know, have had experienced that. That's what they do. And they can't do this. You know, you were so good at doing that and it was so brilliant, but, you know, really fell short here. I'm disappointed. Yeah. And you don't want to take any more risk and, you know, and yeah. it shows in the work. And I, and when you were describing the relationship at Pacific Eye and Ear, it comes out very much in the work. Yeah. And uh, by the way, we are talking with Ernie Sheffalo. This is the block party Ernie's corner. And it is Tony Orlando and Dawn as yeah. part of our discussion. Now, Ernie, I'm looking at the, uh, uh, the, the one uh, on the right hand side, my right. I bet you that is your lettering in there with yes, that. Beautiful lettering that you do is so fantastic. It, it, well, there's it complements an interesting it. story that we're going to get into about that, too. Thank you. Well, you know, my, my job was always the concept, at least the start. And I needed to light the fuse and lettering. I, I, I It was something that I always hated. And I ended up, once the music business became good for me, I started because I couldn't find the kind of lettering and sit type. There was no photo type yet. And I had to create stuff. So I started designing. Matthew Southern Comfort was the first one. We talked about that a couple shows ago. And, and I, I couldn't find what I wanted. So I ended up just lettering it. And I realized, hey, you know, I, I kind of like that. It was kind of easy. And I, I, I start realizing the, the spacing. And lettering is an amazing thing to itself. And, and I became, I had a really good eye for it that I never realized that I had. But, yeah. you know, because of the record business, because of the music business, I was forced to do it. And it was interesting because it's become something that I do all the time now. Look, I think, I, you know, we talked about this. I've done over 530 logos and brands and stuff like that. I mean, that's quite a bit. And 
Well, I mean, it's 53 years. So it wasn't <laughs> it like so, it happened yesterday. It's so yeah. nice because you blend the color, too, because I'm looking at Tony and I'm looking at Atoma and Joyce there on that cover. And it's the lettering just goes along with everything. The, the color just blends so nice. It catches your eye. I mean, Tony and Dawn, their music is fantastic. It but really is. When you look at that cover, it's like, I want to know more about that. Wow, that yeah. is a great well, LP, I well, bet so you. So what happened was... Tony, I, Drew did a sketch, okay? And by this time, I hadn't done the lettering yet. We, I just wanted to show him the sketch so we could start doing the illustration, give Drew time, because it wasn't just like everybody was sitting around waiting for a project. We were working uh, between four and six albums a month mm -hmm. and at least that many corporate projects. So, you know, one minute we'd be doing an album cover, the next minute we'd be doing 13 buses for the RTD or, you know, something for Sizzler Steakhouses and, you know, Alltech Lansing and all these different corporate clients that we had. So there was never a time, I can never remember a time at Pacific Ioneer where we were sitting around waiting, you know, just what are we going to do? You know, I mean, what's going to, you know, people were coming to us and Tony, my partner, was an incredible salesman. And he just really had this charisma. I mean, he could sell an Eskimo ice cubes. I mean, he <laughs> was that good. I mean, really. And he was good looking, too, and smart. Graduated college at 16. You know, I mean, just really a brilliant guy. And we had met at, at Craig Braun. And when we came out to California, we became partners. So I went to Tony with the sketch. Okay. And the sketch is the, uh, the sketch was like the one on the left here. Okay. Or this one here. And Tony looked at it and he said, no, 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 this isn't it. And I go, well, what do you mean it isn't it? He goes, well, it's Tony Orlando and Dawn. Tony Orlando and then Dawn. Okay. And we're at, what he was getting to was the fact that Tony was the same size as Dawn. Okay. And it's really, it'd be like, at a certain point in group's career, the lead singer, whether it's David Lee Roth or Alice Cooper or whoever, they, Mick Jagger, they become the front man. That's why they call him the front man. Okay. And so Tony Orlando was the front man and he needed to be bigger than and Dawn. So the next sketch over that you see here was, oh, and oh, well, let me back up. I showed him the sketch. He liked the sketch. I made a mistake. He, Tony liked the sketch. So we went back and Drew did the illustration. So he finished that illustration that you see right here. I took the illustration back and showed it to Tony. And that's when he said, no, it's not right. He said, it needs to be Tony Orlando. And Dawn. Okay. So if that, in those days, there was no Photoshop. There was no way of no. cutting something no. out and making it. Bigger. So he had to do another illustration. And so he did that second illustration here where Tony is much bigger. And, you know, the other amazing thing about these pieces is they're done in colored pencil. And I think we might've talked about this before with other projects that we had talked about with Drew did the illustration. Drew was a master with colored pencil and colored pencil was a very hard medium to work in because you couldn't blend it. You could blend it a little bit. Like you could take a yellow and blend it with a red and make an orange. Okay. But you can't do it too much and you can't do it too hard. And because the paraffin in the pencil, in the, in the medium itself, won't adhere to the surface that you're putting it on. So what would happen is if you overworked it, it you would end up getting these blotches that wouldn't take any kind of pencil. So you'd almost either have to try and fix it you couldn't gesso it and try and draw over it because it would be a different texture than the board that you were doing on. All these illustrations were done on illustration board, not uh, except for Welcome My Nightmare, which was an oil painting that was on canvas. There were a few that were on canvas that we did, but most of them were on illustration board. So the, to master that medium, to master color pencil is, it's an art unto itself, okay? And as you can see, this illust both these illustrations are done in colored pencil. The only thing that is in colored pencil is the black background. Everything else is blended. Like when you look at the, the fabric on the girls' throws over, the I mean, they're just exquisite. Yes. They look translucent. They look, you know, it's just amazing. And, and we also 
change the banister. If you see, you notice the banister. I noticed the banister. It's very. So there were there were subtle changes that we did, and 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 took the plant out in the background, gave us more room for the copy, the logo and stuff. Because it, like I said, when I did the when we did the first one, I hadn't done the logo yet, and so when we did the final one, when Drew did the second final. He left more room and that's when I had, well, I had actually done the logo and showed it to him. And then we figured out that's how he would place, leave a space, you know, for the, where the lettering would go. And that's and, perfect. It looks just yeah. perfect. Yeah. And I love the ornate, you know, more uh, classical banister railing than the deco, the deco one that was on the first illustration. So, you know, this is really different because he had never done anything like this twice. You know, it, that only came later in the movie business because, you know, not long ago we were talking, we had dinner and, and we were talking and he said, you know, one of the cool things, one of the coolest things about working at Pacific Ironier was we always took into consideration where my illustration would be with your letter. When it comes to the movie business, it's dictated. So Drew really didn't have the freedom that he had when he was doing album covers with movie posters. And I said to him, well, you know, you never really did anything more than once. Have you had that problem in the movie posters? He said, yeah, it happens all the time. And he said the worst one was the hook cover that he did with, with, um, you know, the, with, uh, what's his name? The actor that played hook. Um, oh God, now I got a brain freeze. Uh, <laughs> Dustin Hoffman. I think you're right yeah, there. I was, think it was Dustin. It yeah. was Dustin Hoffman played Hook, and Dustin Hoffman was real. He was really controlling, and he drew changed that painting for a, a half a dozen times before he did it. The he, he said it was like a nightmare that wouldn't end, you know. But it's a beautiful poster. My God, it's just really incredible. But you know that was one of the problems that you run into when you're getting into uh, corporate work, and, and movies are corporate. They're not like records, you know, records. We just had to pretty much please the group, you know, when it came to corporate work. And I experienced that a lot at Nestle and other companies that I work with. Um, you have committees of people that dictate this or dictate that. And some of it's coming from an ego standpoint. Some of it's coming from, uh, you know, uh, bad, bad design suggestions. So you had to overcome all that to get a finished piece. And usually, you know, it ended up with, uh, we didn't have too much experience like that, but sometimes it would end up with where you don't even want to show it because it just really was such a distraction from what you had originally talked about doing, you know? Yeah. Just, you know, one of the things I like when we do our Ernie's Corners is that, you know, our friends on the block and people who are just coming in and discovering, they're see, they're hearing and they're seeing the story behind it. You know, yeah. they never realize, hey, the, I didn't know what went into that uh, movie poster or that album cover. Yeah. Yeah, the backstories, that's why I'm so glad that you're willing to, you know, let us do this Ernie's Corner every week because it is important. It's important to know because it's like knowledge that once you're gone, it's gone. You know, I've been very blessed in, in having a friend like you and, and people on the block and other people on Facebook and social media that want to know these things. You know, they want to know the story behind, you know, their favorite album cover. Yeah. Or, you know, what what went into it? Because you, you don't really realize that, you know, when you just look at it and it's a done thing, you know, and that's the done thing there. That done uh, thing looks done. good. Oh, you know, you know, something that I picked out in that banister reminds me of, you know, treble clef in music. It yes. has a musical communication. They, maybe that's subliminal, but yeah. it, 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 no, you're it's, right. oh, it's neat. Yeah. Drew, Drew was an incredible artist. So was Bill Garland. So was Joe, Ram uh, you know, Joe Garnett and Carl Ramsey, Ingrid Hinkie. We had some great illustrators. And, you know, it's really funny. We had talked about that before. I, I, I don't think about it all the time. But when I get ready to do your show, you know, I start thinking about those days and how wonderful that experience was. It was just really an amazing growing experience. It was an amazing relationship experience with people that were creative. And, you know, I, I, I have never, ever experienced anything like that again. When we all went our separate ways by 19, by 19, the late 70s, early 80s, it was never the same. You know, other people came, but they weren't. And it, it wasn't like a 
deflection on the quality of the work because the quality was always there. And to your point, we always strive for that, no matter whether it was a photograph or an illustration. The quality was always there, but the people, the relationship, it wasn't the same. It was like, um, it was probably like, you know, I always make the analogy of Pacific Ioneer in a band. You know, we were like a band. And, and when you come together as a band and you have success, there's an amazing camaraderie that happens, a sharing and, and, and loving each other and respecting each other that just never, when, the, when a band goes in separate ways and they become parts of other bands and some of them make it, some of them don't. So, you know, it's just, uh, you know, and I, I never could get depressed about it. I used to think about it, you know, like, yeah, we're doing this stuff, but it's not as good as it could have been. You know, if, if Drew was there or Bill was there or Carl was there, it would have been a whole better thing. But <clears throat> I don't know whether it would have or not. I mean, it, I felt that it was OK, but I always felt that there was like this little piece missing. Yeah, it's a spirit. It's a different spirit there. And, 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 yeah. and you know, that that. Um, yeah. And you really feel it a whole lot. Oh, songs. I wanted to know what is your Tony Orlando song or Tony Orlando well, and Don? Don song. Yeah. Well, from <laughs> this album there, you know, there's two. Okay. To be, yeah, to, to be with you is a really good cut, and that's the title of the album, obviously. But for me, and I like a lot of Tony's songs and, and, and Tony Orlando done. But for me, it's Cupid, which is the remake of Sam Cooke's song. Great song. And you know, I love Sam Cooke. I love that song. And Tony and Don do a great rendition of it, and it's on this album. So I would say. Cupid would be my pick for this this particular cover. And I'm going to get into that because, again, it's another album that I didn't know about. So here yeah. again, here comes the education. <laughs> I was just amazed at Tony's career because even in the early 60s, he sang the song Bless You, which was very yeah. nice and Halfway to Paradise. Just yeah. a beautiful when, recording you know, I, of that. I, I wanted to also quickly mention that, you know, when Ivor put us on the phone, all three of us were on the phone and Tony said, I love that album. I love it's the be most beautiful cover we ever had. And he said, I love that logo. And he actually paid us extra to use it on his TV show. So the last season of his show had that logo on there. And like Sean Anna and the Bee Gees paid again to use and own that logo. So, I mean, he really and he and he said, uh, when the next time I come out to L.A., I want to get together with you and Ivor and we can sit down and talk about the old days and stuff and what's ahead. So I'm looking forward to that. That was not long ago. It was probably six months ago. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing him again. I mean, it's been a long time and he's been able to perpetuate his career as I have. You know, I mean, it's it's amazing. I just turned 78 and, and I, I feel like I'm just getting started, you know, um, and there may there are a couple of music covers that I can't talk about, but Ooh. they're gonna be, yeah 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 they're going to be good. There's one of them in particular that I that just came to me from one of the band members, um, and they want me involved in this, and it's going to be huge. And for me, it's like, wow, what a great what a great thing you know to still be around, you know, to be able to reap. You know, it's like planting something and you got to nurture it and fertilize it, protect it and, and, and wait till it grows and bears fruit. And now it's bearing fruit again. You know, I mean, it's coming back around. It's really kind of weird, but it's neat. This could it's be, great. It will be, will be, I can't talk about it yet, but I understand. I understand. <laughs> but we will definitely, we will definitely share that on the block party with our neighbors for sure.